So I'm just curious, how many people here found out about this from the GenSpace mailing list? How many people found out from the Brooklyn biohackers? And how many people from the New York biotech meetup? Cool. So all three venues are represented. Um, I'm Alan Jorgensen. I'm the director of GenSpace. Yeah. Oh, Okay. How many from Mina? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. From where? Mita. It's well, there are two Mita groups. Okay. One is Brooklyn Biohackers, one is New York Biotech Mita. So. Right. And that was indirectly through uh, technically Brooklyn. Oh, really? Okay. Cool. Yeah. We, um, we actually had something like 90 people that responded to this talk. That's why I'm kind of waiting around because I don't want to get an influx of people to the start of the talk, but I think we're probably going to start. So how many of you have been to GenSpace before? All right, so maybe half. So what we are is something that is a new type of entity. We're a community laboratory, which means that we're not affiliated with a university or a company. We're a standalone 501c3 nonprofit. And we were founded in 2009 by a bunch of people who thought that biotechnology and uh, sort of the affiliate sciences should be more democratized. That uh, because of new technological improvements, it's getting easier and cheaper to read and write DNA code. And that, um, it's going to be something that's going to trickle down more and more into the general population as time goes on. Uh, pretty much every aspect of your life is now being touched by biotech, and there's no reason why you can't be a participant in that. So uh, GenSpace was founded by a very eclectic group of people, so writer, artist, student, biologist, and um, we also serve a very eclectic population. Um, we're a good place for students to do science fair projects, but we're also a place for artists to do their work. We're also a place for entrepreneurs. And this talk is one in a series of talks that are given by entrepreneurs, um, mainly in the biotech fields, that uh, we started last year. We had people that are, were running a company that did telomere measurement. Um, we had uh, the guy who actually founded the first startup that came out of Genspace talk last year, Opentrons, which is a, uh, a liquid handling robot on a personal scale. And uh, that was actually very instructive because he went from an idea to a million dollars in venture capital funding and a company that has like eight people and is on another floor of this building in about a year. <laughs> so um, <laughs> the entrepreneur talks that we hold, I think, are particularly interesting because this is a very interesting time in biotech to be an entrepreneur. Um, I'm old enough to remember kind of the, the beginning of biotech when everybody thought it was going to solve all our problems and there was a lot of hype and people threw money at it in, in the 80s. And then um, so many companies didn't deliver on these promises that it crashed and burned. And for a long, long time, investors were very leery of anything related to biotech, particularly because most biotech is biomedical. And we all know that it takes just an enormous amount of money to put anything through the FDA. What's happening now is that there's sort of a new biotech um, centered around the science of synthetic, uh, synthetic biology, which is sort of uh, high throughput um, standardized genetic engineering. And uh, what's happened is that they've been very smart and they've been aiming mainly at products that aren't biomedical products. So things like flavorings and fragrances and biomaterials. And a lot of major corporations are putting a lot of money into this. Uh, corporations like Goodyear are looking for bacteria to make rubber, um, plastics, uh, all sorts of different materials. And then companies like Ginkgo, Biotech, 
uh, that are that are rooted in synthetic biology and really high throughput um, processes are tackling things like perfumes. So it's it's a second wave of biotech investment, but very different from the first one that we experienced in this country. And um, GenSpace is very proud to be kind of a pre-incubator space where people can come and do a proof of concept experiment at a very low price point. Because our model is very similar to hacker spaces in that you have a hundred dollar a month price point and you get access to a fully equipped biotech lab and some shared supplies. Uh, you obviously have to finance anything exotic about your project, but it's a pretty good deal. Because if you go into a regular incubator space, the cheapest I've seen is $1,000 a month. So this is for people that maybe want to try something outside of their job, or maybe uh, they had to take a job outside of wet work. Maybe they had to take a job programming instead of being at the bench, and they have some ideas they want to try. Um, it's, it's a very, very nice space. And uh, we also have um, programs for high school students. We have uh, uh, programming in the arts. Um, if you want to know more about the many things that we do, you can go to our website or ask myself or Dan, who's one of our co-founders, uh, or Allison, who's a community manager. Uh, we also have classes. If you're if you don't have any experience hands-on biotechnology and you want to, we're the first ever to offer courses where the general public can walk in and do genetic engineering. And the courses are listed on our website. So if you're interested in that, please do. We also survive through donations. And so we do have a donation box next to the food that helps pay for the food at these lectures. And if you want to put something into it, we would be very, very grateful. So now I'm going to turn it over to Allison, and she's going to introduce our speaker, who's one of our members and my favorite serial entrepreneur. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Allison. I am, I am Jen Spaces Community Manager. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce Mike Flanagan tonight. Um, just a bit about Mike before we start. Mike has been a GenSpace member since 2014 and has been working on, on a number of synthetic biology projects, especially involving biomaterials, optogenic control systems, bacterial photography, and iGen. Mike has a PhD in electrical engineering from Caltech and has spent more than two decades working at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Bell Labs and, entre and entrepreneurial companies, including Arizo, is that how you say it? Where he was the CTO, and Flanagan, where he is the founder and CEO. So, take it all away. Thank you. Do you have a chair? Yes, we actually have a couple of chairs left. Um, there's also this uh, red wedge, which is, uh, yeah, can also serve as a seat. For free for a for nothing if not cash. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Allison, for the introduction. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to talk tonight. And uh, thanks to you for coming out and um, joining me for this discussion, for this presentation on uh, biology, the once and future digital. Um, this is, of course, a, a parody, an iteration on uh, my favorite book, Growing Up by T.H. White. Uh, the Once in the Future King, which was an Arthurian legend about the story of King Arthur, especially his relationship with Merlin, and we'll return to this topic later on. But I really was turned on to the idea, or was thinking about a, a good title for the talk, based on a lot of what you might be hearing lately regarding claims that biology is the new digital. Uh, and I spent a lot of years in school learning about digital systems, and so this resonated with me in a particular way. And also something that Obviously, I've been moving towards and spending a lot of my time doing synthetic biology, in. and it gave me a chance to stop, pause, and think about how it's a new digital when perhaps it's actually also a very, very ancient digital, and how can something that is so old in this particular instantiation of digital technologies be also considered at the same time something new? So we'll spend a bit of time this evening exploring that. Um, I tried to prepare this as a popular talk. Uh, I'm not sure if you're the crowd that I prepared this talk for, but we'll give it a go, and hopefully it will work out okay. I had a lot of fun preparing this. Um, I hope that uh, this will be interesting for you as well. 
So to set a backdrop, the exact expression bio is the new digital came from a presentation, again, apologies for it being somewhat difficult to see, at least on the brick portion of our screen in the back. Uh, why bio is the new digital, uh, Joy Ito from MIT's Media Lab has a great presentation on YouTube. I encourage you to check it out and listen to if you have not seen it already. And among the items that they talk about are the availability of these types of bio bricks, these types of fundamental building blocks and components that you could put together that are part of another effort that came out of MIT, the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, which has a brief commercial uh, very proud to report that GenSpace won the best community lab award this past uh, jamboree in Boston. Um, we beat teams from London, from San Francisco, from San Diego. Uh, it was very exciting to be a part of that team for that effort. Uh, we'll talk a very little bit about those types of activities in this talk as well, but there's a lot of motion regarding that. Uh, other things you may have heard of, it, it's hard to look at news sources and every day not find a new item about CRISPR, some type of gene editing, which uh, has a lot of hype associated with it, a lot of great promise. Uh, this particular example I thought was appealing, the idea of taking elements of the genome of woolly mammoths and trying to put them into the chromosomal DNA of elephants to try to resurrect some of these types of features uh, in future animals. We'll see how that plays out, but it's certainly interesting. Uh, other areas where this becomes Something like digital uh, has to do with a uh, very exciting biotech company called Twist Biosciences, which synthesizes DNA and is working to do that very, very cost effectively. Right now, the going rate is about 10 cents per base pair per letter of DNA. They're trying to get it down to about two cents uh, per base pair, and there's a number of very exciting new developments that can manifest themselves as these price points continue to go down. Another area, uh, similar to what Ellen talked about earlier, has to do with open trials. And so now you have one area of traditional digital type technologies enabling companies like Twist Biosciences. There's also the idea of increased robotics and automation in companies like OpenTrons, where you can have your own liquid handling robot, or other opportunities, which are also very interesting, has to do with companies like Transcriptic, where the lab moves into the cloud. And so now instead of having necessarily a legion of individuals uh, in very large facilities trying to carry out a number of uh, biotech experiments, we can actually write the necessary software for it, make sure the reagents end up getting FedEx to the right destination in Menlo Park, California, and Transcriptic will begin to execute the code that you prepare effectively and virtually in the cloud, carrying out the experiments that you want to do. It's, uh, it's very exciting and very much changing the way that people like me do this type of work compared to what could possibly be done uh, in the years gone by. Well, it's one thing to talk about individual companies. If any of you are venture capitalists and you don't need to identify yourselves, you also know that this is an area where there's a lot of money uh, being spent as well. Last year, on the orders of half a billion dollars invested in synthetic biology companies, according to SynBioBeta. And Again, you can look at all these individual data points, and I've just tried to provide something like a sampling of different items, but there's almost a zeitgeist or a spirit of the times at work here. And there was a great quote in the biography of Stephen Jobs that talked about how the intersection of biology and technology is really going to be ushering uh, really a new age. And the 21st century, in a sense, becomes this uh, age of biotechnology, the age of synthetic biology. Biology becomes the new digital. But you know, we need to be careful with buzz expressions, as always. Biology is the new digital, is sort of like X is the new Y, orange is the new black, data is the new oil. I won't bother going through any more of these, but you get the rough idea. And so it's often a great sound bite if any of you are journalists, you don't need to identify ourselves, this catches on. Uh, but it's important for us to take a more careful look. And what I've tried to do is ask the question, what do we mean by digital? And in a way, it's a very easy thing to answer. I'm guessing most of you have smartphones or tablets or laptop computers, or sometimes you do things in the cloud with Amazon, or you have a digital television, or you're among the people contributing to the $5.6 trillion spend in data communications by telecom providers in the world. And so, in a way, it's so familiar, it's hard to maybe get a grip of what 
precisely means. And so we'll look at that digital in a slightly more careful way, really looking at two properties that uh, when I was going to school some years back, uh, we very much focused on. And the first thing is we're talking about um, discrete values for information. And it's very natural knee-jerk type response, well, ones and zeros. But there's another very important item associated with that as well, involving the idea of discrete time. And that, in a way, perhaps we're looking at how the temperature is varying through the course of the day, and while it does vary continuously in time, um, perhaps we want to sample that. We want to periodically take a measurement and get access to that. This is actually a very, a very important part of any type of digital system, uh, especially involving technologies such as storage, uh, programming, and a number of other types of technologies we'll briefly look at this evening together. And also serves as a foundation for our discussion on how to make sense of biology as not just this new digital, but boy, it's been digital for billions and billions of years now as we will explore together. Um, so let's spend a little bit more time on discrete values, because I think it's important. Uh, binary digits, that's where bits comes from. Uh, think of a switch, open or closed, it's a one or a zero, a way of logically representing some type of information. And then what's very important is the opportunity to concatenate, or to string together all of these types of details. So that, for example, if you put eight bits together, you have something called a byte, and there's this thing called the ASCII code which takes a particular series of ones and zeros and says this shall be the letter capital A. And in a way, it's a definition. It's a mapping from one discrete alphabet into a different discrete alphabet. Now, of course, we can keep going. Uh, if it's your friend's birthday, then you can say happy birthday. If they're an electrical engineer, you can send them this binary <laughs> sequence. And everybody else maybe just want to get balloons, but that's the rough idea. And noticing encased in this is uh, I've underscored the letter A because that's precisely the binary sequence that I showed you on the prior slide. So in a way, it's very easy once you begin to break it down into its parts. Uh, one last item that we'll talk about, uh, less relevant these days, but there was once upon a time this thing called Morse code, telegraphy. One of the companies I started out working at was called AT&T. Uh, one of those teams stood for telegraphy. And so uh, they got out of that business, but it's still a very interesting and very effective code. Instead of ones and zeros, we've got dots and dashes, uh, just a different discrete alphabet. And also what's neat is they use variable length symbols. So the idea is if you have letters that are used very often, like the letter E or the letter T, they only get one channel use, only one symbol, a dot or a dash. In contrast, a letter that's used very infrequently, such as the letter X or the letter Q, they end up with four symbols. And actually, it's a, an extremely efficient kind of code. This is a variable length example. And again, there are a number of systems like this in biology that we'll touch on there. So again, in brief, we've talked about discrete values. Let's talk a little bit more about discrete time. And just very briefly, I'd like to talk with you about how you might be interested in trying to extract some digital information. Maybe somebody's sending it to you and you want to sample it, try to figure out what they're sending to you. Well, in this time series, um, they're showing, this is called an eye diagram. They're sending a series of one, 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 or maybe one, and then it goes down, becomes a zero and a zero. We've got a waveform that's changing as a function of time. But as a digital system, we know we have to sample at a discrete point in time in order to come up with an answer. Uh, this, of course, is the best time to sample. If you're only going to take an instantaneous sample, because you have the eye diagram maximally open. However, it's a really bad idea to try to sample either at this point in time or that point in time because the waveform is changing. Uh, if you draw a threshold through the middle, you know, depending on the amount of jitter, depending on the amount of noise, you might come up with the wrong value. This is one of the reasons why discrete time is so important in digital communication systems because it allows you to very robustly deal with uncertainties in timing with errors that are introduced in the channel by discrete noise and other sources. Uh, another familiar example of discrete time, but maybe we don't think about it too much, is version information for software that we're dealing with. And so at some point in time, if you've ever been involved in a software development project and you don't have to raise your hands, uh, if you have been, you'll know that it's a furious effort trying to get new versions of software, new features and functionality. You're working with a team of 12 or 15 people. It's a real nightmare, a headache to try to orchestrate and coordinate a build to get to the point where it does something useful. 
So you agree at a certain point in time, that's it, we're freezing the code, that's it, we're trying to take a snapshot in time of all this digital information, and we get a reversion number. Now this is actually coming off of my laptop, and I've got three examples of coexisting software, software that's trying to peacefully get along and do what they need to do. Three different version numbers for the software that's trying to release. And that's fine, for the most part, my computer behaves. Again, we're spending a bit of time on this in these details because we'll see these same themes coming up over and over again when we look at biological systems. And they predate what we're talking about now, literally about billions of years. Okay, so some quick examples of why digital is useful. Again, I think that you guys will all be familiar with, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on. Let's talk about digital storage, and in particular, let's talk about hard disks. Uh, and this is an example from 1956, where for the unbelievably low price of $3,200 a month, IBM would be happy to rent to you this one ton, five megabyte hard disk. <laughs> so I, yeah. so there, there's a bit of a retro feel to the rest of this talk, so um, begging your indulgence, uh, indulgence for that a little bit longer. This PowerPoint presentation, for example, would require uh, about five of these hard disks. <laughs> and this would be a very expensive talk at the rental rates that we talked about before. Another quick example of a digital control system is that uh, by coming up with ones and zeros, there's all sorts of interesting ways that Boolean logic can be used to come up with some way of saying, well, I want the value of z to be equal to x and not y, for example. And you could spend time, you could come up with a logic table for what the mapping would be for the input and output. And even though it looks kind of sterile and abstract, you know, the vast majority of operations going on in devices like this can be largely broken down into constructions of logical systems, not unlike what we've seen before. Uh, putting together billions of transistors can lead to very, very useful technologies, like the one I'm holding in my hand. Uh, to start doing that, you can build an AND gate. It's probably not too easy to see, but just two uh, junction transistors. Uh, this particular example is PNPs. And again, continuing a retro theme, one of these uh, bipolar junction transistors won three people the Nobel Prize for physics uh, based on work that they did in 1947 at Bell Laboratories. And so it looks kind of ugly. It almost looks like they use paper clips. So why are one part of the emitter, one part near the top of that drawing? However, um, put enough of them together, you can do amazing and useful things. So another uh, interesting detail in digital programming is that you can, again, go to digital very quickly. You can look at a bit of source code, maybe written in a relatively high level language like C or C++, uh, map that into assembly, uh, assembly level instructions, uh, shown on the left side of the chart on the right, and these eventually get mapped into discrete values, like a four bit quantity. All zeros, if you want to load a value, uh, 0001, if you want to store a value, and so on. Uh, this looks very crude and very rudimentary, but you can, again, with enough of these, do very powerful things. This is an example of the Apollo guidance computer source code, which was written entirely in assembly uh, in 1969, uh, all printed out, stacked together with uh, Margaret Hamilton. And this is what was eventually useful for Neil Armstrong and others in order to successfully land on the moon, which is amazing. Uh, a little bit in digital communications now. Uh, once upon a time, there was a guy named Claude Shannon, who for a while worked at Bell Laboratories in New York City, and eventually moved to their offices in Murray Hill, New Jersey, where there's a, a statue of him, a bust representation of him today. And he wrote a very famous paper, a paper so famous for electrical engineers or generations of people working in communication sciences, that really, if you said the sentence to them, they knew exactly what you were talking about. This is the very first sentence of a mathematical theory of communication. In a way, it reads very simply and very obviously to us today. But this was really groundbreaking in the years after World War II. By the way, one year after the invention of the transistor, also at Bell Laboratories. The fundamental problem of communication is that of reproducing at one point, either exactly or approximately, a message selected at a different point. Very simple, perhaps, to read, but it really has profound ramifications. Uh, so profound in some cases that there's really an amazing amount of work that you could do building on the groundwork of information theory that Claude Shannon laid the uh, foundations for. In fact, today, right now, as we speak, we have uh, the Voyager 1 spacecraft hurling further and further out into interstellar space now, 
which is amazing, a distance of 12 billion miles, uh, 20 billion kilometers, for people who are more fans of the metric system, communicating back to Earth using a transmitter that's weaker than the light bulb in your refrigerator. 20-watt <laughs> transmitter. Now, it's easy to receive that signal. All you need to do is build an antenna the size of a football field that can be fully pointed, fully oriented, and you cryogenically cool the receiver to 20 degrees above absolute zero, 20 Kelvin, <laughs> in order to successfully receive it. Because there's so much noise, the signal is so weak coming in. Uh, so you catch a lot of photons, and you try to process, process them in as efficient a manner as possible. Um, there was a great talk at Genospace the last time before this one, and the speaker made reference to the concepts of deep time and deep space even. And somebody asked the question in the audience, you know, deep space, is that a thing? This is called the Deep Space Network that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory runs at. It was actually my first uh, job uh, after I finished uh, school. And so, great place to work at, a lot of fun. Now, I actually prepared this slide more than a few days ago. And just yesterday, I was looking at the news, and I thought, oh, crud, I have to update my slides. Uh, well, actually, before I get there, sorry, uh, one more item. So, it launched in 1977, Voyager 1 was, and they put 1977 technology, of course, in the Voyager 1 spacecraft. One of them is a copper, not a vinyl, but a copper LP record that is to be played and at 33 and a third RPM. If you spin it and if you have a stylus, uh, you can listen to Sounds of the Earth, is one of the items that's there. Also, I kid you not, the way that the data is stored on this is using an eight-track tape recorder. Now, not everybody may remember what an eight-track tape recorder is, but this thing has got to be like the clunkiest type of recording technology you could imagine. But it's on there, and it's hurtling out, again, into interstellar space. Which is What's that? But it's still doing great. Still, still doing great. So, uh, what's the news? What's the update? Uh, we may have a ninth planet again. Uh, there was a group at Caltech which killed Pluto a few years back, Mike Brown and other folks. Um, they've actually been looking at the data, and actually in a way, just graphically, visually, it begins to make a lot of sense. Ignore for a moment this large ellipse where Planet Nine is supposed to be. What you're left with is the orbit of all the Kuiper Belt objects that we know of. And almost, notice how almost all of them are skewed to this part of the solar system. Now, really, just looking at it, it begs the question from a symmetry, from a, just a universal flow perspective, wow, what's going on over here? How come nothing ever ended up over here? Because you'd expect that all things being equal, things being you know, birth of the universe, things colliding into one another, all the debris eventually settling down. They did the calculation. I think they figured out the probability that all of these objects would kind of point in this direction was like, 0.0007%, very, very low probability. So they looked at the data, they came up with a fit, and they said the only way they could reasonably account for the presence of these large bodies in the Kuiper Belt is by having a balance of a very large planet, about 10 times, I think, the mass of the Earth, uh, going around, they're not quite sure, uh, going around in an orbit in the opposite direction. And so at any rate, um, we are here, we're so close in. This, this go, it takes about 20,000 years, they think, for this planet to complete one orbit. Uh, Voyager gets out to about as far as this fuzzy area is here to give a sense of scale. But it's also very interesting, because every now and then you think, okay, that's it, I understand my solar system. I understand the, uh, the sun and all the planets around it, and you know, just wait, things change. Okay, so let's, move into the world of biology. So I made the claim that uh, in as much as people say biology is the new digital, uh, it's really the old digital and the very old digital. Uh, what I'll use as a point of reference, and I apologize if this is getting a little bit too technical, uh, the, but the central dogma of molecular biology, because it's a very handy way for us to think about these types of systems. And if you're at all interested in doing any work ever in synthetic biology, you will eventually come across this again, so now is a good time to start talking about it. This is the first time. So it really starts with DNA, which is double-stranded. And eventually cells will make more DNA through a process called replication, where you end up with more very faithfully executed, double-stranded versions of the same DNA that you start with. Uh, how accurate? Uh, errors on the order of one per 10 million base pair. So I'm very good, 10 to my seven, that's pretty impressive. Uh, if you're a communication scientist or a, uh, an E. coli. 
So there's other elements as well in the uh, central dogma. Eventually, if you want to make proteins, which are the workhorses of the cell, they're effectively molecular machines that do very, very useful jobs. Uh, first, you have to tra transcribe the DNA to become RNA, which is a single-stranded version of the DNA, with some subtle modifications that we'll talk about in a short while. And eventually, this gets translated into being a protein. Uh, so this is a, a very famous expression uh, that even Watson and Crick were familiar with and began to popularize. I think uh, Francis Crick was the one who came up with a name for this. But we really see this dogma serving as a useful reference for us to talk about why biology is so digital and how it's so ancient. First is it satisfies those first rules we talked about, being discretely valued and also being important at discrete times. The discrete values, of course, with DNA it's not binary ones and zeros, but there's only four letters. All right, no big deal. Two bits per base pair, A, T, C, and G. And what's very nice about DNA is that there's this complementary pairing that goes on. Uh, A's and T's, C's with G's. RNA, more discrete values, check. Uh, four letters look just like the letters for what you have in DNA with the exception of thymine being swapped out for uracil. But if you're an information theorist, eh, no big deal, just a different mapping, different chemical. But of course, structurally it becomes very different. It's a single-stranded molecule most of the time, and a number of other properties we'll talk about, but it satisfies the rule. It's a, we're so far so good for being digital with discrete values. Protein gets even more interesting in a way, because now you have 20 different letters. And I show them up there, just like our 26 letters in the alphabet minus a few. Uh, the structure is a, a bit more exotic and interesting. Uh, they're very similar in having this type of a structure with uh, a nitrogen and two carbons. But what become very interesting, very important, and absolutely critical is how the side group R, the, res the residues, ends up varying as a function of the protein that you're dealing with. Uh, it could make it charged, it could make it neutral, it could make it more acidic, it could make it more basic. A uh, number of very interesting properties result, but it's discretely valued. So, how about discrete time? Remember that silly example that we went through before where I was inviting you to figure out the right time to sample? But to, well, that still becomes important here because when we're trying to go through uh, translation, or transcription first, excuse me, what really matters is the content of the DNA at the time that you're trying to do this uh, transcription into RNA. And by the way, it also matters, not shown here, when you're trying to do this uh, replication into other DNA. By the way, in the case of DNA errors, uh, that's one of the reasons why cancer is so terrible, because you end up with the accumulation of lots of these errors over time. And normally you need the accumulation of many different errors for, for cancer to manifest itself as the, uh, the scourge and the plague that we know it as today. In the same way, discrete time still becomes important in the case of RNA being translated into proteins because of the way that the amino acid chains are eventually assembled together. What really matters is the content of the RNA at the time that they get translated into these different amino acids. So uh, let's talk about this at another level, and now we'll get to what we discussed before, and this whole idea of version information. Well, you know, instead of being able to tell what version I am, or what version, you know, my pet ocelot is, or whatever other pet version I might be looking at, um, you could pick any point along this tree of life with three different domains, as effectively having its own unique genome associated with it. And eventually, depending on where you are radially traveling at, you eventually can find your path back to a last universal common ancestor, which is maybe the first version of anything, at least from the point of view of what we would be interested in studying for our talk right now, where different points and different branches, again, constitutes a kind of version. How genomes are different from one species to another, and that becomes an important area for many people in the course of studying. But instead of this universal appeal, we can also look at this from a very personal, a very individual appeal. One of the great things that goes on in one of the first classes I took at GenSpace was the idea of trying to study your mitochondrial DNA. And in particular, to try to understand how some of the genetic variants that we have can be studied and analyzed. Uh, there was a great book, uh, The Seven Daughters of Eve, by Brian Sykes, and even though parts of it have aged differently because of new information that's come available ever since the first publication of this book, he really is looking at the majority of the people, I think in the high 90% in Europe, falling into one of these seven different clusterings, or these seven different groups, and 
it's one way of looking at each of these individuals uh, from the point of view of what their mitochondrial DNA uh, is telling them, what version that's at. As one example, in this particular picture, which is of me and my parents, my mom and my dad, uh, me and my mom are from J1D1A. We've got a particular version associated with that particular mitochondrial DNA sequence. That's our capital. This is a version number, if you will, for that part of the DNA running inside of me. Now, of course, there's lots of other DNA inside of me as well. So this version information continues. Now I'm looking at the Y chromosome, which I also have, that I got from my dad. And that brings us to the R1, B1, B2, A1, A, yeah, dot, dot, dot. It's got another version number. It's got another piece of information. Uh, it's been barcoded, in a sense. And it turns out you can do other analyses, as people have done, which is really quite remarkable, looking at how this particular version is very extensive throughout Western Europe. My uh, father's parents uh, and parents and up parents and dot, 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 going backwards, uh, were all from Ireland, consistent with my last name. So, based on the definition we talked about before, I can make the argument that uh, biology is a very old kind of digital, uh, especially using the central uh, dogma of molecular biology as a reference point. We talked about applications before for modern digital systems, and I would argue again that these ideas of storage, control, uh, programming, and communications are similarly true. Again, we can find examples for that, uh, that again are billions of years old. Uh, but first, let's go into a more recent time and talk about a somewhat old storage. Um, I'm uh, a big fan of the British Museum, and one of the crown possessions of the British Museum is the Rosetta Stone, because of its importance in the ability of deciphering what hieroglyphics uh, stood for, uh, because they were able to compare it with both the Monic and the ancient Greek text below it. How old, roughly, would you guys guess the Rosetta Stone is? Um, I mean, I would say it's more than uh, 10,000 years. No. Okay. More than 1,000 years. Yes. yes. Okay. More than 100 years. Okay. Um, it's uh, 2,212 years old this year. So it's pretty old. And you can also argue maybe this is a digital uh, storage as well. Discrete alphabets in each of the three cases. Uh, and also, uh, at a particular point in time, it was recording actually a very uninteresting event. Somebody was you know, giving some land over to somebody else. And so they were capturing this in three languages. Um, well, now let's look at something that's really, really quite old. Uh, this is a part of DNA, horrible to read. Don't worry, you don't have to know what the letters are. But notice the red scratches, the vertical lines in this drawing. And what they're doing is indicating that there's an agreement with the line below it. So this is showing uh, example organisms from three different domains. We've got humans, us from eukaryotes, uh, methanococcus from the archaea, and E. coli from the bacterial uh, domains, and there's actually a lot of vertical lines. There's a lot of agreement for this particular portion of DNA that corresponds to a small subunit of RNA that eventually goes into a ribosome. Ribosomes are really, really important because that's ultimately how we make proteins. You've got to do this right. And about three and a half billion years ago, the last universal common ancestor of these three groups, our common ancestor, found a way to do it well. And if you deviate from that sufficiently, you just don't survive. You just don't make it. So this is an area where we end up with very ancient storage. This is really a message from uh, the beginnings of life, from the beginning of time. And you don't have to go to London. You don't have to go to the British Museum and find this. Every one of you is carrying a copy of this uh, inside of every single cell that's inside of your body, which is kind of neat. Now, this is, again, there's also a minor text sub-theme in this uh, presentation. There's a great book. Uh, if you're interested in this and you don't have a copy, get a copy of uh, the molecular biology in the cell. Uh, if only because the uh, back cover is the absolute best back cover of any textbook I've ever seen in my entire life. It's a parody of the Sgt. Pepper uh, Beatles album cover with each of the uh, authors, uh, Albert Johnson and the others, uh, posing in it. So it's uh, I don't know these guys, but I, I think that uh, I could get along very well with them. So let's talk about old digital. Now, you might look at that picture before and say, ah, you know, yeah, I saw some red vertical lines, but yeah, there were gaps. There were places where maybe things changed. Um, yeah, granted, three and a half billion years is a long time, and maybe some things could diverge a little bit, a little bit, maybe. But 
holy cow, now let's compare this stretch of histone H1 protein across humans, mice, rats, cows, and chimps, and look at the residues. These are the amino acids, the 20 different amino acids that we talked about before. And there is an absolutely amazing agreement, a staggering agreement across all 60 of these amino acids, which is remarkable that it's been preserved as well as it has. Now it turns out histones are extremely important for the storage of uh, DNA. Uh, the chromatin is made uh, very much of uh, the H1 protein and other uh, proteins as well to allow the efficient spooling of the DNA so it can be stored in such a compact manner. It turns out that every cell in your body has about two meters worth of DNA if you were to totally just stretch it out. It's one like, but think how small these cells are. The only way it works is if you can spool it up and store it very, very effectively. This makes that happen. Um, the last common ancestor uh, for all of us up there uh, lived about 100 million years ago. And so reasonable belief that this stretch of information is about that old as well, extremely ancient. So from a storage perspective, man, DNA seems like it really got its uh, act together. Uh, going on to the British Museum one last time in this presentation, the oldest object in the British Museum is 1.8 million years old. It's the Old Bay stone chopping tool, uh, even before there were humans. Humans didn't show up until maybe about 200,000 years ago. And boy, this has got to be by a factor of 50. And again, you don't need to go to London, you don't need to go into the British Museum. Uh, every cell in your body has got many copies of this. Well, if that's the old digital, what about the new digital? Uh, what opportunities are there for DNA storage? It certainly seems like it can last a long period of time. Um, certainly DNA can be made very small. What are the opportunities? Well, this was actually considered in another great book that if you're interested in this, I encourage you to check out. It's called Regenesis by George Church and Ed Regis. And they talk about a very interesting system. And I apologize if it's hard to read. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. The idea is that you start with some body's digital information, which is like everything today. Think YouTube, think uh, the Genspace website, think you know, anything. A uh, bunch of ones and zeros that get concatenated together like we discussed before. You can encode this into a series of A, T, C's, and G's. Uh, take two bits, for example. You can map that to any one of the four letters and be done with it. You can then Go to a company like Twist Bioscience and have them synthesize the DNA that you have begun to define. And actually, it's really as simple as that. You end up with an ASCII text file with a series, a series of ATCs and Gs. You mail it to these guys, give them a credit card number, and sometime later, they'll send you back the synthesized DNA, which is great. And then store it, keep it somewhere. Um, now, I'm not going to promise you that it'll last for 3.5 billion years. I'm not even going to promise that it will last 100 million years. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not sure exactly how long it will last. Uh, some quotes that I've heard, if I remember them correctly, might be on the order, depending on how cold you keep it, how well you store it, maybe 100,000 years, maybe, which is probably a lot better than the Atrac tapes, unless you send them into deep space, uh, for example. Um, also, that's a, an item to task, you know, what kind of temperature would we need, how would we need to control it, but still, opportunities for very serious storage, and also very, very small size. By the way, before we talk about the details of how small the size is, if you ever want it back, send it out to get sequenced. All you need is really on the order of one, just one of these strands, and through the miracle of polymerase chain reaction or PCR technologies, you can make lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of that, and eventually go through the decoding operation, because you send the information out to a bunch of other companies like GeneWiz, give them a credit card number, and they'll tell you what the sequence of the DNA is, which is a, a really good deal. But now from a storage perspective, um, what's remarkable in terms of potential is that worldwide, at least in 2011, there was about 1.8 zettabytes of data that was produced by everything. Again, YouTube, Genspace website, you know, my email, your email, everybody's. Uh, that's 1.8 times 10 to 21 zeros. You can store this in four grams of DNA, four paper clips worth of DNA you've got 2001. That's, that's pretty impressive. Now, it's not been built yet, it's not been done, nobody's tested it out for uh, 
200,000 years to make sure that that will work. But you know, worlds are turned on ideas like this, and it's a pretty neat one. So uh, let's go back to the world of old digital control, biological control. So instead of having ones and zeros, like I had on that rather dry PowerPoint chart, which if, you, if you've forgotten already, that's totally fine, but we're basically going to be revisiting it now. But instead of having a one and a zero as an input, imagine instead I said, is there lactose, which is a kind of a sugar, for example, from milk. Anybody who's lactose tolerant, you can thank uh, beta-galactosidase for giving you that ability. Um, is there glucose, which is another simpler type of sugar? Um, because if there's lactose but no glucose, please manufacture beta-galactosidase to digest that lactose uh, component. Otherwise, don't waste your time. Don't waste your precious energy, precious resources, manufacturing beta-galactosidase because you're wasting your time. So again, we end up with uh, molecules like we talked about before, more complex sugar with lactose. One of the neat things that beta-galactosidase does is it breaks this oxygen bonds, uh, so-called beta glycosidic bond in between these two six-carbon sugars to make two separate six-carbon sugars, which then get digested as if they were glucose eventually. There's actually one of them really is glucose all by itself. So this is a logic chart. And of course, from a manufacturing commit perspective, you're really looking at the absence of glucose and the presence of lactose to make this protein. Otherwise, don't do it. Right. This sounds like logic to me. Uh, and I've spent more than a few years trying to build these types of logical systems. Hopefully it sounds like logic to you. And this has been going on for, well, for almost forever. Uh, for probably a more millions of years, if not closer to a billion years or so. Um, more details about this can be found in another great book. If you're interested in this and don't have a copy, uh, go out and get one, uh, Molecular Biology of the Gene. Uh, you spend a little bit of time with your indulgence on this because I think it's interesting. I showed you the tr transistors. Um, there's a very interesting phenomenon that goes on, which I didn't fully appreciate until I started taking some of the classes here at GenSpace, which is, you know, you see these pictures of DNA. This is such an iconic image. You look at this, you go, ah, yeah, that's DNA. I've totally imprinted on that idea. Uh, it is so unusual to see DNA in this state in nature. What really tends to happen is, Proteins glom on and grab on and hold on and don't move and cause interesting things to happen in response to that. And we'll talk a little bit about that now in the context of that uh, logic diagram that we saw a moment ago. There's this one sequence of DNA that is going to be very, very attractive to a protein called the cap protein, a catabolite activator protein. Another sequence of DNA very close to it, it turns out, which is going to be very attractive for a different type of a protein to grab onto and to hold onto. And that grabbing on or not grabbing on makes all the difference in how eventually proteins are expressed in a very cartoonish and graphical manner that we will now look at together. Well, here comes our cat protein. And if you're in a condition where there's no glucose, there's lots of these cat proteins that are ready to grab onto and hold onto the appropriate section of DNA. And it's an activator protein. So it wants to encourage transcription to take place. However, there's also that other segment of DNA, which it turns out if there is no lactose, this repressor protein, LAC-I, is going to grab onto and not let go of. Now it turns out that the enzyme that produces RNA has to have contact with DNA in order to make messenger RNA and eventually express the protein that you might be interested in. Um, if this lactide protein is in the way, it isn't going to happen. And this satisfies our first logic state, right? If there's no glucose and there's no lactose, then do not produce beta galactosidase. Check. There's only three more. Uh, you're already glazing over. Um, again, now we've got a different picture, but something has changed. We're in the second of the four cases. Now there is lactose. Well, the cap protein grabs on, no problem. However, something happens to the lac I protein. And again, it's a cartoon, and we'll talk more about the caveats associated with cartoons later. But the structure actually changes for the lac I protein, which is really interesting. It goes, the fancy expression is there's an allosteric change, but it actually causes it 
to become different than it was before when you have lactose around. As a result, it's not capable of grabbing onto and holding that stretch of DNA. You have naked exposed DNA now in this area, and as such, when the RNA polymerase eventually comes around, boink, grabs onto it, the cat protein is going to encourage it to stay in place, picture like a little magnet where I've got that star shown right now. Uh, it's going to hold it there, then you get the transcription, then you end up with translation, then you end up with the desired protein. Check. This is the most important part of how beta galactosinase gets produced. And eventually, we could go through the other states as well. There's glucose, but there's no lactose. It turns out when there's glucose, you end up with a structural change in this cap protein that prevents it from successfully grabbing, from holding on to the DNA at the cap site. The lac I grabs on, and again, the polymerase can't get there. The other protein's in the way. And finally, in the last case, you end up with a situation where you have both glucose and lactose, and effectively, the cells are fat, dumb, and happy. They have all the glucose they need. They don't want to waste the time or the energy to digest the lactose. Um, so nothing ends up latching onto the DNA, but it turns out that the attraction for the RNA polymerase to hold on to, to latch on to, and begin the transcription is going to be very limited. And so effectively, you don't end up with any beta galactosidase again. Now, obviously, this is just a couple of quick slides for a uh, public talk. There's an enormous amount of additional detail I gave you on the book, and then just the quote from George Fox said, really, all of these models are wrong, but some of them are useful. And so hopefully, in the context of this talk, this has been at least remotely really useful. That's it. What's that? That's a Fox champion Fox. Uh, yeah, actually, it is. Yeah. It's a George Fox. That's right. So if that's all digital, and that's been going on for a long time, what about the new digital? What opportunities are there with that? And this is where we start getting into some programming. Uh, here's a, uh, again, a simple cartoon drawing where I've got the uh, outer membrane of a, an E. coli, and we've changed the DNA. This is not an ordinary DNA uh, from an E. coli. And actually, if you're interested, we've got a bunch upstairs you can take a look at. Uh, it actually ends up with this special membrane protein called CCAS, which will attach to it. And another second component of the so-called two-component system floating around in the cytoplasm. Called CCAR, I get the word. Uh, this, by the way, didn't even start with an E. coli. It started with a, a blue-green algae. Uh, we can come up with a special picture for our stretch of DNA under study. And we've got a promoter again that's waiting for the um, RNA polymerase to attach to it, and maybe a sequence of DNA that will encode what needs to be produced, which is again my favorite protein, beta galactosidase. If the right wavelength of light strikes this membrane protein, then it autophosphorylates. It actually will end up effectively with a phosphorus group attached to it. And then as the second component wanders around, it eventually bounces into that membrane ground protein. There's a phosphotransfer, steals that phosphorus group away. It's now able to attach to the DNA and cause transcription to take place which eventually leads to translation, which gives us beta galactosidase. This does not naturally occur. This is not what E. coli normally does. However, we are able to change the, the genetic instructions, we're able to change the programming for E. coli in order to carry out this task. And it turns out if you put just the right chemicals into the uh, agar plate that the E. coli is resident in, it will form a black precipitate. It will make a dark stain in the immediate vicinity of that E. coli. So effectively, we have a, a logic state, a control statement. If there is a light input, especially this color green, then produce a dark output. And again, this is based on work that was done uh, by Tabor and others uh, as recently as 2011. Now, you know, I said, okay, it looks like another sequence of operations. Uh, if we think about E. coli in a moment, the remarkable detail, this is a gut bacteria, an enterobacteria. There is no light getting into your intestines where E. coli lives. And so if there was any kind of photosensitivity that E. coli ever had, it long since lost it 
but we found a very happy home in our guts and in the guts of all of our ancestors and probably a whole bunch of primates prior to that. Uh, but we're able to put that in now in a matter that we'll talk about later. And when we look at an apparatus to realize this, we can have a green wavelength signal shining down, but we don't shine it uniformly. There's some areas that are darker, some areas that are lighter, some areas get light, some don't. Well, that's, that's the definition of a photograph. And so we have the negative of the image that we want, and eventually when it produces an output, when you look played after the fact, you end up with the image of a person's face, or maybe with the Gen Space logo, and again, with apologies, I'm obviously not a photographer. Um, I'm a, a technologist. I was more interested in trying to build these systems to try to get them to do something that's useful. But it does speak to something very interesting because the opportunity for control of bacteria or control of anything with light is very promising. Light has exquisite control properties. Uh, you can make it shiny or not shiny. I can make sure the light is shining here, but not there. I can turn it on and turn it off at precise times. I also have the opportunity with uh, the right system to even have light of different wavelengths. They eventually use proteins that have sensitivity to those different wavelengths. So there's a lot of interest these days in bioreactors that are controlled effectively by these types of light stimulus, which is interesting. And, but again, there's a large artist community at GenSpace, uh, which is great. And I don't know, it just seems to be interesting to pick a project that you can show somebody eventually what the output of your work was. Um, old digital. Let's talk about biological communications as I check my time. Ooh, we're getting close to the, I guess we started a little late, so we're uh, going to keep it. I'll keep going. Okay. So um, let's talk about plasmids. Plasmids are at the heart of much of what we do in synthetic biology. A plasmid is a closed circular loop of DNA. It's actually relatively small compared to the chromosomal or genomic DNA that is native to these cells, and we'll talk about a perspective on that in a short while. But these have been occurring naturally for a very long period of time. And this is a, uh, a photo of a random E. coli that is, uh, say, got its, this is not photo, photo it's I Photoshop that I had this plasmid. But each of these red loops can be viewed as these plasmids. And very often, you'll end up with a large number of these plasmids. The copy number, if you will, will be very high in these individual cells. Um, one of the things those plasmids can encode for, because it is DNA, it is a kind of instruction, is say, start producing a very long pilus, a very long hair that will stretch out and eventually potentially come to contact with another bacterium in the immediate vicinity of the cell. Well, then it turns out there's a sequence of events that causes this to effectively serve as a bridge for the transfer of a plasmid into this new host organism. And then what will happen is that it effectively will take you, you know, take advantage of the fact that you've got other replication machinery inside these cells to make the right number of copies of this new plasmid. And eventually, this guy will look a lot like this guy. And then they two are two friends, and they tell two friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, uh, this is a concern for many applications, for many situations because this is how antibiotic resistance can be spread in a lateral fashion from one bacterium to another. So if you hear about in the news of uh, you know, MRSA and other types of increasing amounts of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, this is one of the primary mechanisms for that to be taking place. In particular, because very often in these naturally occurring plasmids, you'll have some type of a way to confer resistance to an antibiotic, and as a result, the new bacteria that has been in contact, if you will, we'll talk more about that, what that means in a moment, ends up with that antibiotic resistance capability as well, because it's literally in their DNA now. They just injected new DNA into the cell. There's also other mechanisms in naturally occurring plasmids to form the pilus to engage in that kind of transfer. But we can also use this in synthetic biology in a much more safe and controlled manner, as I will discuss briefly. But before we do that, let me challenge myself. I, I said this was digital communications. Really? Is this digital communications? Well, let's go back to one of my earlier slides, um, serving as a kind of reference. What would Claude Shannon say about what we were trying to do here? Well, that's the same text as there was before. Let's break it apart. Um, yeah, I have a message. 
The message is all of the DNA, all of the information that's contained in that plasma that is now being sent, that is now being transmitted, and is now being received. One point compared to another point, okay, fine, those are two different point locations for the individual bacteria at the time of the information transfer. There is a selection. Very often it's an antibiotic selection. I've got ampicillin, I've got chloramphenicol, I've got canamycin, I could have a whole host of different antibiotics that is being selected for by the presence or absence of this type of an antibiotic resistance that's being transferred. So, not need to put too fine a point on this, but when Claude Shannon wrote this a bunch of years ago, he was really talking about a human making a, a choice of what message was going to be sent. What's really interesting here is that it's actually the environment that's making the choice in natural scenarios. There's another way we get to apply this as synthetic biologists where we get control of it, we get to choose, we do the selection. And we'll talk more about that briefly. Well, let's go back to Claude Shannon. Um, exactly or approximately, well, you know, when we're hijacking the host cell replication machinery, you're going to get exactly what you started out with, the 10 to the minus 7th uh, error rates. So incredibly good error rates. And then finally, in terms of, well, reproducing, yeah, this is as close as you get to reproduction in bacteria, but of course it's asexual um, type of reproduction. It's, uh, this is digital communications, I would argue. And I think so with Claude Shannon. So, um, what about the new digital communications now? Well, in a way, it's what we've discussed already. Let's think about an iPhone again. And I used to do a lot with iPhones at a recent job. And if we think about how they're structured, there's a base foundation of an operating system. And on top of that, different applications get to reside. And they make use of services and capabilities and data that the operating system makes available to it. Now, in a similar way, one way you can look at what we're trying to do as synthetic biologists is take a bacterium that has already got some amount of chromosomal DNA, some type of wild type DNA that does all of the housekeeping, keeps it alive, gets food, processes it, uh, reproduces at the right time, uh, goes on about its life, but we add these plasmids to it. We inject these plasmids, not with, pi the, with a pilus, but now with other techniques uh, like uh, chemical transformation, electroporation, whatever they mean, but we get the plasmids in somehow. They effectively become these other apps. You can have the DNA instructions for this dark blue plasmid correspond to this different app, and maybe this is starting to produce cellulars, for example, a, a certain type of uh, biomaterial where you string a bunch of glucose together with a, an oxygen bond. Maybe these two plasmids are now trying to carry out some kind of a photosensitive situation where they are trying to do something different in response to a light stimulation like we talked about in one of the earlier slides. So when you think about work that we're doing in synthetic biologists, uh, in synthetic biology, it's useful to keep in mind this type of a metaphor. The new capabilities we're trying to introduce are effectively like new apps that we're trying to introduce into a smartphone. No one app tends to be that massive compared to the size of the chromosomal DNA. There are limitations on how much new extra instruction you could put in. If we think about chromosomal DNA as a kind of an operating system metaphor, then what's interesting to think about is how different organisms, oh, well, you know, I've got one operating system here on my coffin, I've got another operating system that's native on my cell phone right now, maybe another on my tablet that I have back. There's you know, different operating systems, different devices, different chromosomes for different organisms. Part of synthetic biology from an engineering perspective is making sure you're selecting the right host chassis. Now you have wild type choices when you do that, like the E. coli K12 strain that we use upstairs. There's also a lot of work that's been done looking at artificial uh, chromosomes, coming up with maybe getting rid of a lot of the functionality that wouldn't be going on in your ordinary garden type E. coli, and maybe whittling it down to a smaller number of instructions. Again, just another type of an operating system. So, where is synthetic biology today? Uh, are we more in the mode of listening to A-track tapes from a relative technology perspective and listening to long play records or LPs? Or is it more like listening to music on your iPhone, more of a modern way to do it, a very advanced way to get the information? And I only picked this particular artist because it's easy to spell her name using nucleic acids. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, sorry. I, uh, I think Julie challenged me to put at least one uh, on her, so, or comment like that in the talk. 
Uh, where are we in synthetic biology today? Is it more like a clunky one ton, five megabyte, which, you know, is not bad. It's better than having no memory whatsoever in 1956. Or is this a 128 gig drive that you can hold easily in the palm of your hand? Is it more like a 1947 transistor, or is it more like a eight inch wafer where every single chip has got a million transistors on it? Respectfully, I would argue that we're more on the early side than getting things done. But having said that, it's, it's still a pretty exciting time. When the transistor was first invented, yeah, you bet that was a fantastic thing, especially if all you had was vacuum tubes prior to that. Um, Having that massive amount of storage, one ton storage, there were people, you know, IBM would not have built that if there weren't people who were going to be spending the money to try to make use of it. There are things you could do today, very useful things, even though we're still in the early days. And also, it's very exciting because not everything has been done yet. There's still a lot to do. And it feels great to be in an environment where things are as open uh, as they are in terms of that kind of opportunity. But of course, with opportunity is a collection of challenges. And there have been a lot of words written, uh, some of which I will uh, end up touching on again. In general, in biology, there's a limited understanding of many systems. And you might even say most systems that you're looking at. The good news is that there are some that are extremely well understood. If you take the courses at GenSpace, if you have not done so already, there are many systems that you will build that will work because we actually understand them. And actually, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to get started with a fairly well understood system. Uh, eventually you'll perhaps get interested in exploring your own projects, and it's very possible that this will be reaching limits of what has even been published in those subject areas. Uh, that's a great challenge. However, um, from an entrepreneurial perspective, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because if it was really, really easy to do, and a lot of other competitors could do it, and very quickly, you begin to lose a lot of the differential advantage you have by eventually coming up with a solution. So it's a weird sentiment, but in general, if you find something that's really hard to do, it's tempting to feel a little bad about it, but the hopefully more mature part of your person will remind you that, good, actually this is one more barrier my future competitors will need to overcome to get to where I am today. Uh, it takes a long time to do a lot of things. Um, part of it is because, in a way, it's like, sowing seeds and waiting for them to grow and seeing what sprouts up out of the soil. Um, yeah, bacteria, it's great. The ones we work with reproduce double the number every 20 to 30 minutes. Um, but if you need a billion of them, you know, you might have to wait overnight. So something you start at 5 p.m., you might have to come back the following day. Very different than the instant gratification you might get as you just try to compile a new bit of software. You just want to try something out very quickly. And the state of the simulation software has not quite reached the point where you can very uh, reliably count on what that software is telling you in terms of uh, how a real system might behave. Now, again, not meaning to talk out of two sides of my mouth, but to prepare a, uh, more of a balanced view. Uh, if anybody has ever worked in the software industry and you do not need to identify yourself, you know that sometimes getting a full software release out takes a little bit longer, sometimes, than you might like it to take. So long cycle times is not exactly the unique characteristic of synthetic biology. Uh, roughly anything worth doing, anything that's hard enough, takes time. Uh, the trick is finding things worth the investment. And finally, a third item, similar to the first, uh, on predictability and scalability, uh, touches upon that. If we understood it better, we'd be able to predict it better. Um, and a lot of the effort to go from a benchtop success towards more of a commercial viable success is, uh, is substantial and can take a fair amount of time. Uh, but again, it's uh, very often, or at least for the right problems you work on, absolutely worth the effort. Uh, there was a great quote in San Francisco at the last SynBioBeta conference that uh, DNA is just like code until it doesn't work and then it's just DNA again. And you deal with secondary structure issues, you deal with primer dimer problems, you deal with, you know, your organism doesn't like the pH, you deal with the fact that you know, you've got D arabinodes and you really shouldn't be using L arabinodes, so what's, what's a stereoisomer anyway? And you deal with all of that, and it's, it's fine and it's part of the fun. So doubling back on where we started with uh, the once in uh, future king, um, this is the once in future digital, and biology is absolutely that. It's been doing digital for billions of years, arguably, and it is well poised in this century 
in this coming decade to begin to move in a profound direction relative to what digital was able to accomplish uh, in the 20th century, especially after the Second World War. Um, coming back to this book, again, my favorite book is Child. My favorite character in this story actually was the magician Merlin. And in part because Merlin had a very interesting property. Uh, Merlin actually lived in reverse time. Every day when he woke up, uh, unlike us, he didn't live yesterday, he actually lived tomorrow. And all of those days after tomorrow. He knew that Arthur was going to be king in brief. He knew his job every day when he woke up, while Arthur was a child, was to prepare him, was to get things ready for Arthur to be the great king that he was going to be. He was his teacher, his mentor, his ally. He knew what the future held. And he woke up every day and asked himself the question, given that knowledge of the future, what am I going to do today? What lessons do I have to teach Arthur? What do I have to do? Um, in the same way, you know, obviously I'm a magician, just a technologist. Uh, I have a rough idea of what this future looks like as well in terms of the significance of synthetic biology. I wake up each day trying to figure out what I need to do given the vision that I see for this future. And that's uh, yeah, kind of the basis. So again, just with a minor quote at the end about the difference between technologists and magicians uh, from Arthur C. Clarke, that any sufficiently uh, advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so that uh, part of why we keep going and do what we do. Uh, finally, a, a great big thank you to uh, a whole bunch of folks, uh, some of whom I, I feel bad if I've left out. Alan, for the chance to uh, let me talk with you tonight and to let me use pipettes and do other work in the lab upstairs, which is great. Will, who's uh, been a great colleague and friend uh, for many months now working on these projects. Uh, all the 2015 team, and actually I see at least one of the parents here from that tonight, so welcome and thanks for coming out. A uh, host of other folks, including uh, Sherry, I'm not sure if she made it, but she was the one who loaned me the lenses. She's a photographer. She really does photography for a living at this day. A hack. Then a bunch of folks at large uh, who have either given me stuff or helped me out or been a shoulder to cry on. And uh, or free samples, uh, and especially family, friends, and past colleagues from JPL, Bell Laboratories, and Arizo. You can hear my voice, uh, you know who you are. So, thanks. Yeah, so I'm not sure uh, how we're doing with uh, time overall, but. Does yeah. anyone have any questions? Sure, we'll have questions. Yes. I'm actually thinking like on this slate, you might have mentioned this, but um, what is your vision for synthetic biology? What applications do you see would come to the market sooner than later? So uh, the question is, what uh, is the vision for synthetic biology? What products would come to market sooner or later? Um, I think the reality right now. Uh, so in a way, it's, it's hard to talk about, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. So in a way, I'll dodge that and just talk about what's really happening. Uh, because actually, any model where you don't test it out in the data that's going on right now, you know you need to do the find and work on. Uh, there's a lot of tool-based work, uh, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of planning. Uh, maybe one way of thinking about it is during the uh, gold rush in the 1849, in California, they say that people made more money selling shovels and denim jeans and tools than people ever made gold, you know, mine gold out of the hills. And yet, yeah, you think, well, how, how does that even work? Well, they were providing a lot of infrastructure, a lot of foundation, a lot of basis. The view was it was all about the gold, but it was really about the population of the state that would eventually become you know, the most populous state in the country. And uh, you know, if it was its own country, it would have uh, GDP probably in the top 10 and the top 20 countries. So a lot of infrastructure right now, that's in the early days. So think twist biosciences, synthesizing DNA, and more companies trying to do that. Uh, think a company like Opentron is trying to go through automation. Think exciting companies like Transcriptic, which is trying to put lab operations through the cloud. And actually, that was for the first uh, 10 minutes of the presentation. So no, 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 that's fine. It's, it's a good way to recap or summarize it. Uh, beyond that, um, I'll talk about the longer term view as a way of answering the opposite of your question, which is uh, what's not going to be in the immediate term. People are still really freaking out about the idea of genetically modified organisms, especially God forbid eating it. Or, well, I don't know if I want any of that GMO type stuff going into my body. Well, if your choice is, yeah, there's going to be a moment. 
living to be 200 with a quality of life in your 40s and having genetically modified organisms in the room, I think a lot of the computers are going to stop that. I think they're going to stop that technology. There's actually this whole other talk which I will not give. It all it only lasts like seven or eight minutes. Is um, you know about Ben Franklin doing electricity and how some people say, I don't know, Ben. Yeah, this electricity stuff is kind of dangerous. If you get electrocuted, you know, if you put wires in the building, it might burn down. You know, think about all the terms. You know, they might invent electronic devices, and you have dinner with your son, and just spends the whole time doing this, and doesn't even talk to you. Ben Franklin, what's the story with it? And should we bother doing that? And the reality is, you know, you weigh the pros and cons. But it's going to take a while to get there. Um, more media term, biomaterials, I think it's going to be big. So like in the movie, The Graduate, somebody rushes up to Dustin Hoffman to shake some other shoulders and says, plastics. Plastics are going to be big. Um, I actually think it would be more biomaterials. That's one of the reasons why I'm interested in cellulose in a big way. Um, we put paper into printers today in order to print things out. I want to take paper out of printers. Uh, I think it, you know, there's a lot of other really interesting things you could do in the manufacturing of cellulose. But, so, Eventually, therapeutics, uh, medicines will be longer term in many ways. Uh, I think shorter term, less controversial. Yeah, please do. I think we learned from the last million bucks in biotech, and everyone is running like hell from therapeutics because they're so expensive to get through the system. So the low hanging fruit is flavors and fragrances, it's biomaterials, it's things that don't have that long FDA pipeline sort of thing. You know? So they're being really smart about it, and they're using those materials in strategic partnerships. And Ginkgo has a partnership with the Williams Cooking, one of the oldest food companies in France, for example, to build up their infrastructure. Um, on, on a project that they know isn't going to involve a lot of really good That's right. Yeah. Uh, to add to that quickly, what happens if you have a, um, I will be very wrong, um, from engineering and uh, biology, what if you have a, like, uh, manufacturing at home, can you share the program for the medicine? Because then you reach the FDA testing, and anybody wants to, who wants to manufacture medicine, can do it at home. Yeah, that's a, so the question is, what about publishing information on how to construct these organisms so that people could basically, you know, print out their own, you know, pills that they want to take and potentially begin to bypass the FDA. I, again, I'm not going to claim to have any kind of uh, you know, therapeutic or FDA type of experience. I'd be surprised if the FDA didn't somehow find a way to begin to regulate that. There's lots of things that the country would not want to be sold, for example, but still ends up being sold somehow. And it's actually a big discussion around cocaine yeah. now because they put the, the manufacturing pathway for cocaine into microorganisms. Yeah. And there's a big discussion about, you know, sort of if this, if this gets out, people can just bring it up, you know, and it's going to be the reaction. Yeah, it, uh, both the law enforcement and the drug cartels, you know, if you don't have to have the field or anything. So it's it's kind of a wild world out there now. Yeah. That's a good question. I, I, yeah. Not sure how it would uh, play out. I mean, obviously, there's a certain amount of illegal tr drug trading already going on. Maybe it just gets, you know, your, your contact is your printer. Yeah, that's what happens. But it's Let me blunt that. Yeah, please. Comment. Yeah. Um, a lot of clinical trials fail because the diagnosis well, that's true. Awesome. Mm -hmm. The better we get the, the, the epistemology and the dramatics of improving the diagnosis, yep. the error rate and the confidence level of the, of, the, of the drug trials will go down, and the error rate goes down, the sample size goes down, and of course the clinical trials go down. So the key, the computer is also the key to fixing the FDA problem. Interesting. Um, in the communication section, then you mentioned that all of the data from 2011 can be stored in four grams of DNA. To access that information, you would then need to send that DNA to be sequenced by someone, and then the sequence would be translated back into computer code. Yeah, into Is there yeah. a more direct way of doing that, or do you <laughs> see that process being streamlined in the near future so that DNA could be a more viable storage method? Well, I think it's still at least. In the example that I showed, uh, I think there is at least a 
a viability to do it at all. I mean, almost anything involving DNA, if you're trying to synthesize something or get it back eventually, you're gonna have to go through that kind of PCR route. Um, however, right now where you might be sending, I give the example where I take this DNA and I send it out to GeneWiz, uh, there's companies like, uh, is it like BitION? I forget the name of the company. It's yeah, got like it's, this little thumb drive that does its sequencing for you in your laptop. You know, I can have a USB stick and I could just provide a DNA sample there and do the sequence for me the right there. The technology so. for reading DNA code is progressing much faster than writing it. Um, if it were a car from the time that we sequenced the human genome in like 2004, uh, the analogy would be the car would go 100,000 miles an hour and cost 10 cents. So it's outstripping um, what Moore's Law, which many of you are familiar with from electronics. Um, the price is coming down precipitously and our ability to read the code is increasing with each new technology. And the device he's talking about, uh, it's called a MinION, and it's the size of a flash drive it's not quite as accurate yet as sort of the gold standard sequencing, but what they're aiming for is on the fly, uh, just personal access to the DNA code. The other thing that you might not be, there is single strand sequencing, you don't have to amplify it. Okay, sure. There are such technologies, they're just really expensive. But so again, these are technological problems that people are solving, and, and actually the head of the Beijing Genomics Institute, which is the biggest genomics sequencing facility in the world, uh, was setting a target price of 10 cents for a human genome, or $10, sorry, $10. Right now it's about 5,000, but $10, uh, you know, he was, he was predicting that, but they were, they were aiming for that. So it's going to be more and more uh, accessible and, and, and easier to read DNA code in the future than it is now. And there are preservation systems that they're looking at that involve certain sort of types of glass and everything else where the half-life of DNA right now is something like 10,000 years. They extract it from Neanderthal bones. So it's already really hardy, which is what you want in the source code. <laughs> you don't want it to degrade easily. But they're looking at ways of preserving it. What's the purpose of planet? Uh, more on the biomaterial side, actually, this thing. Slide so up that. I didn't want this to be a commercial. So, it's, uh, <laughs> but just as you can. Since you're right, I'll pay you five dollars later. And so, it's uh, more on the products and services side, very early stage, uh, very much seed funding effort, focusing on biomaterials, some idea of uh, incorporating optogenetic control and the stimulation of that. And so, yeah. Yes. Yes. A uh, question. Uh, the analogy of DNA being digital holds at a certain level, a certain order of magnitude, at a certain level of abstraction. But below that, are we talking about quantum physical chemistry? Isn't it somewhat more analog? Oh, I, all digital is by that same argument. All digital is extremely analog as well. Uh, I showed you a very clean uh, diagram earlier with the transition from ones to zeros. It's never, ever, ever uh, that clean, and you're dealing with. Um, in many cases, for more advanced systems, a lot of device effects as well. You know, trying to keep Moore's law going, real, honest to goodness, Moore's law going. You've got um, a lot of quantum effects going on where visual ones and zeros become an abstraction beyond the real device physics that are going on in the transistors that you are working with. So it's, it's true in both systems. Um, and so, in a way, that doesn't invalidate the metaphor. Or biological systems are argued because it is so much the case that uh, even traditional digital technologies are very much subject, especially as they go to higher speeds, higher densities, uh, running the same types of limitations and effects. Anybody else? Oh, uh, over here. Brian, is a little bit of a naive question. For, for somebody who is not an institutional user of this technology, what is, what is the energy cost? Like, uh, this is a follow up to the earlier question. How much does it? How much does a gen space class cost? And I probably, this is a commercial. <laughs> so, talk, talk to Alan later. That costs nothing. Uh, you get a glass of wine in the park, and uh, I, I don't know. But, but we, there's intro to biohacking and bio boot camp. Uh, several courses. You'll take them. If you're anything like me, you're really, really going to like them, and you're going to want to keep doing this. And you realize you're running out of courses, but there's lots of things you can be doing on your own. 
and for the unbelievable low time price of $100 a month, you get to be a member of Genspace. And then it's additional costs associated, oh, now I have to get this DNA synthesized. Oh, now I have to get a sequence. Oh, now I have to go and buy this chemical from Sigma Hall. Oh, great, now I gotta get this stuff and do it in the pilot. You know, it adds up, but it's, um, yeah, it's to totally worth it. Uh, Oscar Wilde said that a cynic is a guy who knows the cost of everything but the value of nothing. The, the value of this journey by far outweighs what you know, you'd be taking on your wall. I'd say the biggest cost that is sort of hidden is time. Because when you're working on, say, something electronic, you can work on it and then you can just put it on a shelf and come back to it when you want to. And if you want to do it fast, you can just stay up all night and drink a lot of coffee. But biological systems have their own rhythm. So a cell, like an E. coli, is only going to divide like every 20 minutes. So you may load a program into it, but then you can't figure out the result until the next day. And there's no way to speed that up. So there's a built-in cost in terms of time. And also, I mean, it's nice with Genspace because you have other people in the lab that you can ask, you know, hey, can you take my plate out of the incubator and put it in the refrigerator? But again, you've got something alive you have to take care of. So you can't just put it in the refrigerator indefinitely until you get a moment to do it. You have to commit to keep working on it for a while. So I think the hidden cost is really not in the amount of reagents that you buy, because that's really determined by the project. A lot of the stuff at Genspace is common, like gloves and pipette tips and certain reagents that we all use. That's just included in the membership, right? But I think what people are really surprised about is, is, is the fact that you get tied into this time. Like you have to start something and maybe you can roll away to the end. And you can't stop them from doing this. Something will go wrong if you know. Yes. Um, can you make a few comments about the entrepreneurial space uh, in biotech? Can you give a few comments about uh, entrepreneurial space in biotech uh, compared to, let's say, other areas, ease of obtaining capital, uh, interest in the market, uh, long cycles, but like quantitative stuff? Yeah, so I guess on the uh, one of the first slides, we talked about how half a billion dollars uh, was invested in 2015 from the synthetic biology companies in particular. So that's a very good sign. Uh, in terms of ease of getting uh, venture capitalists interested, I would say it's competitive with it. I think there's enough venture capitalists out there who are looking at this right now, realizing they need to move in that direction as well. Um, there can be herd mentalities sometimes, where people start thinking, I don't know if I want to be the early adopter of this, and they start going. Once they start seeing all of their other friends talk about how they're sinking tens of millions of dollars, they start going, oh boy, dude, maybe I better start doing this too. Because eventually my boss is going to start talking to me about, well, how come you're not including any you know, synthetic biology companies in your portfolio. So it's not, it's not a very good reason to do it, but it's not an unusual reason to this do it. This is the time. Yeah, I mean, this is that's a really good time. Yeah. Especially in California, New York is more conservative in the environment, but uh, definitely um, the West Coast investors, th there's been some money thrown after some stuff that I think is really <laughs> sketchy. <laughs> I mean, there, there's been a lot of money thrown at some of these companies. I mean, Twist, how much did Twist just Just over 100. 100 mil. Total, yeah. yeah. Maybe even 100 mil. Actually, just that. There's another round of it. Yeah, I think it's just yeah. yeah. more yeah. I mean, these, uh, this is the time yeah. for these companies. People I know, but throwing money. I, I would counter to say that biotech goes through booms and busts very regularly. So yeah. Helen started talking about the bust in the 80s, and then right. it busted again in the 90s, and it busted again in the 2000s. And uh, it's been a little frothy the last few years. Um, uh, you just mentioned the investment in synthetic biology. The investment in all biotech is several orders of magnitude greater. And so people are already starting to say too much money is pouring into biotech. Um, so it's a great time for synthetic biology, but it's always a great time for biotech. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, so a question more on trying to make this cheaper. What's the state of actually being able to well predict the well protein structure? Because if it seems that 
uh, proteins are like not if they're in the cell. Mm -hmm. It's like if we could actually predict their structure and get their function, which means that we could start to store it. We could basically start creating metabolisms for like whatever materials we want to create. So what's the state of like, for example, do we have highly optimized wave functions that give us the structure? Yeah, the short answer is no. The longer answer is there are people working on that, and for some systems they do better jobs than for other systems. They tend to be more proprietary at this point. However, there are companies that are trying to make this more of a universal approach, more uh, common across others. That's a uh, for speaking personally for a moment, I, I don't have the time to wait for them to get their entire act together. A lot of the history of synthetic biology has been based on an approach that, for lack of a better expression, becomes more of trial and error in some ways. Um, there's another great book that I didn't talk about in this presentation called Biology is Technology by Robert Coles. And in that book, there is uh, a great metaphor about uh, the aviation industry. It turns out, at the time of the Wright brothers, and even for decades after that, um, you have a lot of great aviation work being done but in a largely trial and error type of system. You don't have Von Karman at this point. You don't have a lot of other people who are going to come up with the right equations for fluid flow and understanding how to you know, really understand the theory very deeply for uh, a variety of different phenomena that you encounter in flight. But they figured out how to do it and built actually pretty good and pretty impressive aircraft using that kind of a, an approach. Um, would they have loved to have the full theory put together? Absolutely. Did they have it? No. Did they want to wait for it? Did they need to wait for it? Absolutely not. Um, interestingly enough, did the people who eventually come up with theory um, profit from all of that experimental body of work, all that empirical knowledge? Absolutely. So in a way, you could view the uh, pursuits in the more tried and true trial and error um, serving as a foundation for what I think will eventually be the most effective of those simulation systems. You, so you don't need to wait, it's a short answer. And that's also why synthetic biology is automated and high throughput, is because you try as many iterations as possible in a high throughput, um, miniaturized manner, and then develop your own rules for building things. No, that's very important. Yeah. Okay, any other? Oh, no, sorry. Can you apply it to artificial intelligence? Can you apply uh, these types of techniques to artificial intelligence? Um, yeah, I mean, going back to even just the rules of art, there's a number of opportunities for the application of artificial intelligence systems. Start to come up with an identification of different parametric combinations that are better than others, but they're different. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, can I build something that is artificially intelligent using these types of techniques? Oh, uh, someday. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to end. Not today. <laughs>